writing skills can be really useful as an artist, not just for writing artist statements, but also if you are writing a grant proposal, you have a project that you need to write about. If you can't be articulate about that, that is sometimes the difference between getting a grant and not getting a grant. Sure, your artwork is core to who you are as an artist. That is really what we are being looked at for. But I think being an artist, a professional artist, it's a lot more than that. I was actually saying to one of my former students the other day, I was asking them, well, how much of your time percentage wise is spent doing non art making tasks? So, for example, social media, writing grant proposals, putting together your website, those types of things. And they and I agreed that it's minimum 50 percent that actually a lot of our time is not spent making the artwork. Of course, we'd all like it to be 100% making the artwork, but I think the reality is that very few of us have that as a luxury. I wanna encourage you guys who are watching right now to pop into the chat box, ask me questions that you might have about writing an art statement or even trying to define what one really is and what are some of the requirements, what are some of the contexts that you may have to write an art statement in, because it's a question that I get very often from a lot of students and, and professionals actually as well. And it seems very timely because I am right now teaching a senior seminar class, which is supposed to well, the intent is to arm students with the tools that they will need to navigate the professional world after art school. And we actually just went through a round of writing artist statements. And afterwards, I was like, wow, everybody needs help with this. This is not just this group of students. This is a very common struggle for a lot of artists. So hopefully I can shed some light into that process for you guys. Let's start out by just defining what an artist statement is. Because I think a lot of people are very confused about what an artist statement actually has to have in it in terms of content. My feeling is that a successful artist statement is a statement where somebody who has never met you before, doesn't know anything about you as an artist or even what your artwork looks like, can read the statement and get a pretty good sense of what type of artist you are. Now, of course, there's a huge limitation in terms of what you can learn about somebody from an artist statement, but I think an artist statement, you have to see it as an opportunity to tell people something about the artwork that maybe they would not be able to figure out by just looking at the artwork. So in some ways, the other statement does have to stand on its own. It has to be a cohesive statement, but it also is a chance for you to talk more specifically about the artwork in a way that maybe is supplementary to what you're already doing with the artwork. Now, to be clear about this, I don't think an artist statement should explain your artwork. I don't think that an artist statement should be there to compensate for something that is maybe lacking in your artwork, because that to me is not the intent of an artist statement. The intent of an artist statement is for people to really understand, okay, what are some of the themes that you explore in your work? Maybe something about your motivation, why you are making the work that you're making, maybe a little bit about your inspiration. I don't like it when people spend a whole paragraph talking about, well, I'm inspired by these artists and this genre. It's okay to bring that up, but you don't want that to be a dominant theme in your artist statement. And then I think definitely something about the materials that you work in, the format of your artwork, what context you expect the artwork to be in. For example, some people really are gallery artists. Their work is meant to be in a white cube gallery. Other artists are not like that. Some artists work collaboratively. Some artists work on public art pieces, which is so much more complicated because you have to think about the context, the environment that that artwork is actually living within. And so it varies tremendously from artist to artist. But I should know when I read an artist statement, okay, this person is a printmaker. They work primarily in etching. They use aquatint. 
and they process it in this specific way. And maybe there's somebody that really cares about the hand in the artwork, or you could say, well, this is somebody who really comes up with an idea, but then later on, the actual fabrication of the artwork comes down to a big crew of people. There's a huge range of different ways to do that. If you guys are just joining us, I'd love for you to jump to the chat box, ask me your questions, contribute to the conversation. I am actually right now working on a section on artprof.org which is to help prepare students for life after art school. I'm hoping it's relevant to everybody, just giving you some of the information you might need, some of the tools. And I think that this stream is gonna be a part of that because an artist statement, they don't teach you how to do it in art school. I mean, I am because it's part of this class I'm teaching, but it's not an experience that everybody has. Okay, hey Young Lee is saying, this is what I needed because I need to write an artist statement for a college application. Carrie Murphy is asking, should we be modest, humble, confident, realistic, critical, opinionated about our artwork, or merely describe our art materials and methods? Carrie, I would say it's more the latter. I don't think that an artist statement should be opinion-based. I don't think you should be making any commentary about whether you're succeeding. I don't even think you should say something like, I aspire to create this effect. I think it should be a lot more matter of fact, and it should be pretty confident sounding. I mean, I've been talking to a lot of my former students. I've been helping some of them write cover letters and emails in order to get jobs. And I'm frequently surprised that a lot of them are really self-deprecating in the emails. And I've been trying to explain to them, look, it is not okay to put yourself down in an email. You're trying to advocate for why you're qualified for this position. And you do have to sound confident. And a lot of students said to me, oh, well, I feel like I'm bragging. It's not bragging. It's, it's really just making a statement that is firm about who you are. I mean, if you start going off into this big tangent about these gigantic lofty goals and you want to take over the world and revolutionize 21st century art. I mean, yeah, you don't want to do anything like that. That's so extreme. But I think you can just make statements that say, this is what I'm doing. These are the themes I'm exploring. This is what I work with. So I do think there is a certain amount of confidence that has to come across. I wouldn't say that being humble or modest is the place for an artist statement. If you want to be humble and modest, that's probably something that is better suited for social media in a more casual situation where you are communicating more directly with your users. I think in social media, people feel comfortable showing that side of themselves, whereas an artist statement Generally speaking, it's usually in a couple contexts. For example, you probably want to have an artist statement somewhere on your website. And so if we go here to my website, you can see I have a really short artist statement on my website. It's literally like two sentences. It's a very short paragraph. And you guys will find that your artist statement, and I'll get into this more later, you're going to have to have multiple versions of it because depending on the context, you might, for example, need an artist statement that is two pages. You might need one that is just a sentence. You might need one that's two to three sentences of a single paragraph. So the idea is that you have enough content that you can whittle it down to whatever length you'd like it to be because some grant applications will give you a limit. They'll say, you only have 250 characters to say this, or they'll say minimum three pages, in which case I always feel like, crap, I gotta write three pages. I mean, I'm sure there are some people who do. I don't know that I would be capable of doing that. But the point is you have to be flexible in terms of that length. And so on a website, I keep my artist statement incredibly short because on a website, people aren't there to read extensively about your work. They just want to get a quick gist of that. And I also have find doing usability testing on websites, especially I did so much on artprof.org, when I observe the way people interact with the website, it's alarming how little people read. I mean, there's a lot of situations where if there's even three sentences, 
people give up by the time they've read five or four words. And then sometimes people just look at a giant chunk of text and say, you know what, I'm gonna bother because it's too long. Too long didn't read, right? There's a reason why that comes up. So actually what I'm gonna do for you guys is I'm going to post a link to my about page. So in case you guys are curious and you wanna see a better look at that, so about page, on my website with a very short artist statement and you guys can take a look at that. And by the way, I am gonna show all of you some really basic artist statements, some examples to get you thinking about different ways people have approached it. And I've actually put these artist statements in the video description below. So you guys can take a look at that if you're having trouble looking at the screen because I know some of the text is a little bit small. Getting back to the context of artist statements. If you think about it, an artist statement, okay, you got a website, you probably want it there. I would say if you have an exhibition at a gallery, usually there is information at the gallery about pricing, about you, usually there's like a narrative bio, and usually there is an artist statement there. And that is a place in a gallery where it is okay to have a longer statement. Like I would say maybe a page, would be sufficient and most galleries do want an artist statement and you probably would use it on a press release as well because you want to say something about who you are a press release usually it's not super long because you're trying to give out information quickly to a reporter you're trying to tell them where the show is how long it's lasting so you don't really want that to be super long i would say the two places where you can actually end up writing a pretty comprehensive artist statement would be on a very extensive grant application where you're really proposing a project and you're talking about your past experience. And then I would also say if you ever print a catalog, an exhibition catalog. So a few years ago, I published a pretty big catalog of these 50 drawings that I did. And so there was an essay by one of my colleagues about the work. There was my resume in the catalog. And actually, I think I had an artist statement. I'm pretty sure I did. I mean, it could have been that maybe I didn't put one in because there was the essay. But any type of print material where you're giving out an exhibition catalog, or maybe it's just a book about your work that you have published, that is another scenario where a much longer, more extensive artist statement would be very appropriate. If you guys are just joining us, please feel free to jump into the chat box. I know lots of people have questions about artist statements. They are frequently one of the most challenging things for a lot of artists. I mean, I struggle with them a lot. I don't think I'm an amazing writer, but I think I'm okay. I think that I do know how to write in a pretty clear, succinct way. And I do like writing. I mean, that's why I wrote Ask the Art Prof, which was a advice column on Huffington Post for a long time, although now it's HuffPost, but I don't mind writing, whereas I know some artists really dread it. Carrie Murphy is saying, hard to be confident when as artists, confident when as artists, we've probably all been our own worst critics, definitely need to work on short and concise and informative while proudly presenting my work. Great topic. Yeah, it is really hard because I think that out of everybody out there who's looking at our artwork, we are so rough on ourselves. I mean, I definitely have been in situations where people have been complimenting me about my artwork, like at a show. I, I don't do this with people I don't know very well. This is usually with like my artist friends, like people who I really trust. And they'll be telling me, oh, wow, you did so well in this area. And it's like my first reaction to a compliment like that is, oh my God, but this got messed up and this is wrong and I don't like this area. It's like, when I look at my work, all I see is mistakes. I have so much trouble really, I guess, congratulating myself for the parts that go well. I mean, I guess I acknowledge them because at a certain point you have to say, oh, well, this is good enough to put in the show. I feel pretty content about this. But ultimately when it comes down to it, I do really end up all the time criticizing myself so much. And I know it's hard 
to put yourself out there in a confident manner, especially if you don't have a lot of experience, if you just got out of art school, if you had another career and you're just totally starting from scratch, it can feel very uncomfortable to do that. You can feel like, oh, well, who am I to be saying this about myself? It feels ridiculous sometimes, but guys, just get over it. You have to do it. it it's just part of the package. Okay, Cha Na is saying tips for seniors writing an artist statement for the first time in the context of art school applications. Okay, um, Cha Na, the way I would start is, first of all, I want to clarify the artist statements that I have been talking about for the past few minutes. I'm referring to those in terms of a professional context. Now, a statement for an art school application is somewhat of a different beast. I mean, there's certainly, I think, there's some crossover for sure, but I do think an art school application, they're not expecting you to be professionals at that point. I mean, I'm not saying you should be self-deprecating at that point either. I mean, you do want to come across as confident, but I think what I would do is try to think of what is the cliche? Just picture you are a high school senior, you're applying to art school, you all have something in common, okay? You, you all want to go to art school. You want to be in a creative community. You have a hunger for learning. You are trying to really exploit your potential as an artist and to learn. So you have this hunger to learn, okay? So you ask yourself, what are the topics that probably this very specific group of people are all going to want to write about? For example, I was talking to one of my colleagues who does admission for MFA programs, which I know is not the same as BFA, but they told me that almost every single person writes in their statement about how, oh, I want to be in a creative environment with a lot of creative artists so we can stimulate each other and learn from each other. Like that is so generic. That is a statement that I think is true for sure. I'm not saying that that's not a legitimate reason to want to go to art school because it certainly is. And for me, that was definitely one of the biggest highlights of art school. But the thing is, that's what everybody thinks. And so either you have to put a spin on that idea that is different than what your average person is going to write, or you write about something else. I mean, I actually think what is good is to get really specific and to tell anecdotes and to speak about a very specific experience. Because what I find is that a lot of these college applications, people talk about, I want to help people, I want to build community. And those are all really good initiatives, but they're generic. They're not specific to you. So you have to ask yourself, what can I write in my statement that nobody else can write about, that only I can write about? And that can be tricky to think about, but I think the specificity is very important. Like, for example, I have this funny fantasy that I would love to be a journalist someday. So I actually follow a lot of journalists, I mean, mostly like NPR people on Twitter, because I, I like seeing how the profession works. I like seeing what they talk about. And one of the things that I saw on Twitter the other day was they said in journalism school, one of the main directives that they give journalism students is get the name of the dog. Now, what does that mean? So if you are a reporter and you are writing a story, let's say it's a story about somebody who has a dog, you can write, Sarah had a dog and they were brown. You could write it like that. That's accurate. That's really what it was. Or you could write Sarah's dog, Rufus, was brown. Think about the difference between those two statements because giving the dog a name gives a dog a level of importance that it normally would not have. If you say it's a brown dog, it's like there's a million brown dogs out there. But is every brown dog named Rufus? So if you can think about a particular story that other people don't know about, that you can really talk about in a very specific way, I think that is very, very helpful. Because for me... Probably the story I would tell actually goes all the way back to elementary school because when I was a kid, I don't know why, but when I was in elementary school, every single year there was a new art teacher. Like it was just like this revolving door of art teachers. 
And I was very frustrated because the teachers weren't there long enough for you to have any type of connection with them. And a lot of them weren't that good. I felt like a lot of the projects were very cookie cutter. And it was those art projects where it's like no matter what you do, everybody ends up with the same result, which to me is like such a bummer because art class is such an opportunity to do something wonderful. And for me, I had this wonderful art teacher who came when I was in the fourth grade and she was like my biggest fan to like the 100th power. Like I'd never had somebody speak to me the way she spoke to me. She would say things to me. Like I remember I did this charcoal drawing once and we were outside drawing trees and everything. And she said with so much passion, looking at my drawing, she said, that tree is alive. And I remember that stuff. I mean, it's nine years old. I mean, there's so many things I don't remember in my life, but I remember that. And I think telling a story like that is very, very helpful. And when you hear something like that when you're in the fourth grade, that has a real impact. I mean, my daughter said to me the other day that her teacher really recognized and said to her, you're a very good writer. And I think she's going to carry that with her for the rest of her life. I mean, who knows? Maybe she forgot and isn't going to care. But I mean, I think the likeliness that that's going to happen is actually pretty high. So I, I think that those stories are very good for college applications. I mean, I don't know. Maybe there's other stuff that they tell you. But I think so much of being a high school artist is just like eliminating the cliche. Like if you want to know how high school students usually draw self-portraits with pencil, just do a Google search. I do it right now. High school self-portrait and pencil. See what pops up. I bet you anything, they all look exactly the same. It's probably a front view. It's probably dead center with a blank background. That is the um, generic version of a self-portrait. So if you're a high school artist and you don't do those things, you don't have a black background, you don't have a straight on face and you don't stick it in the middle, just like not doing the cliche, I think puts you ahead. Now I could be wrong. I'm not a counselor in terms of the writing and everything, but I know that as a college professor, that is what I personally would really want to see. Now, going back to what I was saying before about having multiple versions of your artist statement, I think that you can really like recycle your artist statements. And so you don't have to tell yourself, oh, because I need to have an artist statement that's much longer, I need to just totally start from scratch. You don't have to do that. I mean, basically, once you write an artist statement, you have it forever. And I do recommend that you guys prepare two versions, okay? You prepare an artist statement that is like you in general, like in general, no matter what project I'm working on, this is who I am. And then you can write an art statement that's very specific to a particular body of work because each body of work from a professional standpoint does address a different theme. And sometimes your general art statement just doesn't go into depth enough. So let me show you guys some of the versions that you can look at. So I'm using the teaching artists on artprof.org. And so we're gonna start with Eloise. Eloise is a filmmaker and collage artist. And so here's her bio page. You guys can go in and take a look at that. And this is a one sentence artist statement. And you might need this. I mean, it, it feels sort of silly to do this. I know a lot of students roll their eyes at this, go, oh, this is like that corny elevator pitch but you know what, you might need it someday. Because actually, <coughs> this is very embarrassing, but when I taught at a liberal arts college a few years ago, there was this like new faculty luncheon, okay? And so at the new faculty luncheon, I was sitting at this table with all these other faculty members. I didn't know any of them. And they were from all different departments. So like economics and science and psychology. And so none of them were artists. And it was that like really awkward thing where you like introduce each other and people were saying to each other, oh, what work do you do? What, what is your research, right? Which is fine. That's a totally normal question to ask. And I just froze. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> what do I say? And so 
The thing is, when you're in a context like a luncheon, which is so casual, you can't launch into this big lecture about who you are. That comes across as really annoying and pretentious. And so I do think an elevator pitch like this is helpful. So you can see here, Eloise has written, Eloise's work explores the intersection, mechanics, and deconstruction of power, politics, and narrative. And so in that one sentence, you have a gist of what Eloise is engaged in as an artist. And so you might have to do that someday. I mean, it's hard to do that because I think a lot of artists don't really want to be summed up in a single sentence, but sometimes it's like inevitable. Like sometimes you just have to do it that way. And I actually have had students complain to me that at critiques, I ask them to sum up as succinctly as possible what their drawing was about that week. So I say to them, okay, tell us what you were thinking when you were making this piece. Did you have a specific intention? How did you think it came out? And I say to them, look, keep it really short, you guys, okay? Don't go on and on and on. And I had a student one year who said to me, look, you're being really unfair because you are expecting me to whittle down my ideas down to almost nothing. And the ideas that I have are so much bigger than that. And I cannot manage to reduce my artist statement to such a short sentence. And my reaction was, okay, have fun, <laughs> because um, you're either going to freeze at that luncheon or you're not going to be going to a lot of luncheons. I mean, the only time I think when you really have an opportunity to really speak extensively about your work in great depth is if you're asked to do an artist lecture. That's the only time when you can legitimately, without being a jerk, launch into some big thing about your work and people are there to hear it. And so that's totally fine. But in a lot of contexts, you will need to use this. And th this could be something that you get on a grant application. Grant applications, there's such a wide range. I mean, there is one grant application that is so quick. And I love that grant application because it's like upload eight images, fill in your information, and then boom, you're done. It's like the world's easiest grant application. And then there's others where you're like slaving for days, writing all this information. You have to like format your work in a certain way to submit things in a certain way. I mean, there's some grant applications that are really hardcore. Like for example, the Guggenheim Foundation, that is a hardcore um, application. And the Guggenheim is really for mid-career artists. So I guess the expectation is that at that point, you're experienced enough that you actually do have quite a bit to write about. And that is true. If I were to do the Guggenheim application today, I wouldn't have a major problem. It's just, it's a lot of work, like making sure it's really thorough and very, very professional. So there's a wide range and it's good to know how to reformat your artist statement in a way that it feels natural for the length of time or the situation that you want to put it in. Okay, let's look at a statement that's a little bit longer. So let's take a look at Lauren Welch's. Lauren is a teaching artist on artprof.org and Lauren is a painter. She works primarily in acrylic painting. You can see one of her paintings over here on the slide. And she writes in Lauren Welch's paintings and installations, she explores how color and pattern are used on the body to express or conceal one's identity in relation to one's environment. Her current body of work takes a split approach between body and landscape and is heavily influenced by naturally occurring patterns. One way you can test if your artist statement is really working well is see if you can pick out some keywords. So for example, I know Lauren really well, so it's sort of hard for me to look at her statement objectively, but if I just scan the words, the key words in here are paintings, okay? Installations, color, pattern, body, identity, environment, split approach, body and landscape, okay? And so if I think about all those words, and I asked myself, okay, do those key words, do they really sum up who Lauren is? My answer is yes, because when I think about Lauren's paintings, I definitely think about color because she's like the world's biggest color nerd. And I mean that as a compliment, by the way, because I'm not good at color and I'm always like super jealous of her color mixtures and pattern for sure. I mean, I've never seen anybody so obsessed with pattern. And then 
paintings and installations that gives you the format. But also she talks about how color and pattern are used on the body because Lauren has a lot of um, performance pieces where she's really painting very dramatically on the body. And so the body really is a type of canvas for her. And then thinking about the context for that body. So she has a lot of performance pieces where it's not just the body being painted, but she's actually creating an entire environment for that figure. And so she's also talking about naturally occurring patterns. She does derive a lot of her work from nature. And so to me, this gets further than Eloise's statement for sure, because Eloise's statement is one sentence. I picked it that way for a reason, but you can see this gives you a little bit more specificity. So maybe one way, an exercise some of you guys can do if you're trying to write an artist statement is to write down some keywords that you think really are specific to you. Like if I were to do that, I probably would write gesture, face, emotion, expression, extremes, figure, body, surface, texture. Those are some of the themes that I work with in general. I mean, I have more specific things in terms of my body of work, but to me that really does express who I am. And then you can use that as a starting point and then depart from there. By the way, a lot of people ask me about whether to write the artist statement in first person or in third person. Okay, so Lauren's here that we're looking at. This artist statement is written in third person. It really depends on what you're comfortable with. I don't think there's a correct one. I mean, I would say it sort of depends on the casualness of the context. Like for example, on my website, which you guys can take a look at here, I do write in the first person because for me, first person feels a little bit friendlier. You guys might disagree with me and feel free to do that. If you guys want to jump into the chat box and tell me if you disagree or give me your experience writing an artist statement or if you guys have questions, things that I can help you with, I tend to think it's a little bit friendlier. And the only time I would really write in third person is if it's like an exhibition catalog. I feel like in a context like that, that makes sense to me. But most of the time I do write in first person. Hey Young is saying, if you send an email to you, can you critique some of my artwork? Well, you know what? I get so many requests that I can't do it over email. However, if you guys want, the best way to get a critique from me is to submit to our YouTube live critiques. So let me see if I can pull up that page up here. Um, okay, that page is not pulling up. Sorry about that. Um, let me put the link. So how to submit to our free YouTube live critiques. So you just go to this link and you upload your form. You do have to write an artist statement for the critique because it's very helpful for us to know a little bit about the work. And on that submission form, you guys can watch some examples of live critiques because they are free. You don't get to necessarily be guaranteed that you're going to get me. It sort of depends on the scheduling and everybody's availability. Um, the other option you guys can do is if you would like to, for example, purchase a portfolio critique, we do do those. So I am going to put that link in the chat box as well. And so that's like a 30 minute portfolio critique and that you definitely can pick the person because we do charge a fee for that. So purchase a portfolio critique. I will give you guys that information there in the chat box. Okay. All right. So, and, and again, if you guys have questions about that, please let me know. And we do have a few openings this month for the YouTube live critique. There's only like two left, but if you guys submit within the next like day or so, you might be able to slide into October. Otherwise you have to like wait till November, which is a little bit longer. Okay, so getting back to third person and first person, it's just what you're comfortable with. I, I think just whatever you think works out very well. I mean, I think the more negative side of it, I mean, if you want to think about it, I could consider that maybe some people, I don't think this, might feel like third person is a little bit pretentious, but I don't think it matters, honestly, whatever you guys are comfortable with. Let's look at another moderate length artist statement. So this is Deep D Menon, and Deep D is another teaching artist on artprof.org, and Deep D is an animator and filmmaker, and she does wonderful 
odd. I mean, I we call them ugly, but I mean, I love them. They're quirky and strange. Um, so if you guys take a look at this slide, you can see this is one of her drawings and you can go to her bio page, which is here, and you can find out more about her. You can watch her bio video. And so you can see in her artist statement, let's just break down some keywords first before we actually read the statement. Okay, alien life, conspiracy theory, interplanetary warfare, fear and anxiety. Okay, let's see, colorful, character driven and light headed. Okay. So if you just look at those key words, you guys are going to find that you actually do know a lot about Deep D just from those key words. So let's read the whole thing out loud. Deep D has always been fascinated by the possibility of alien life. Often thinking about conspiracy theories and interplanetary warfare, Deep D is drawn to themes of fear and anxiety, usually finding inspiration from her own set of fears. Her work is often colorful, character-driven, and lighthearted. And I think that's a pretty succinct um, artist statement. The only thing that I think is sort of missing from her artist statement is she doesn't say anything about animation and filmmaking. And so I definitely would sneak something in there because somebody should read your artist statement and know what type of artist you are. And actually, it's a similar thing if we go back and we look at Eloise's artist statement. Eloise's, well, I mean, this isn't really a statement. This is more like a sentence. But I would think ideally, Eloise would want to have something in there that says film or collage. And Eloise, I know, does a lot of sketchbooking. So just a little bit in there that says something about that process. Okay, so let's take a look at my artist statement. This is my moderate artist statement. And if you guys have questions about this, let me know. And if you want to read these statements, they are in the video description. So you guys can take a look at that. And all the links to our bio pages are down there as well. And so mine says, my studio practice uses drawing, printmaking, and sculpture as a means towards exploring the extremes of human emotion, using the human figure and face as a vehicle for expression. So you can tell from here, I work in drawing, printmaking, and sculpture, extremes of human emotion, human figure, and face. Those are primarily what I deal with. Now, this is a general statement. This is not a statement that I would use for a grant application because on a grant application, I would want to explain in much greater depth how I work, what my process is, a little bit about my motivation. And so this is very short. This is like, this is the statement from my website. So th this is definitely okay for a website, but it's not good enough for a grant application. Okay, so let me show you guys a longer version. And I'm not gonna <laughs> expect you guys, and I'm not gonna read this all to you right now. You can go to the video description and take a look at that later if you guys um, aren't able to see it on the screen. But you can see this is much more involved. So this is a project called Falling that I worked on for four years. And this project actually had multiple streams of artwork. So the first part of it was a series of 50 portraits. The second part of it was a series of beeswax sculptures, which I then ended up transforming into photographs. I had a small series of mezzotint prints. Mezzotint is an intaglio printmaking technique. And then the final part of the project was these large scale figure drawings, which measured about seven feet by four feet. And so it was a very involved, very complicated project. It was driven by a personal experience. So I talk about my experience with depression and bringing myself in and out of that experience and trying to figure out really like a sense of self. And so I talk a lot about um, finding myself and separating myself from the depression and, and seeing that I was a separate entity from that because I think for the longest time, I did think that depression was my personality. I, I really treated it as, well, that's who I am. That is who I am inherently and there's nothing I can do about it. And so when somebody steps in and says, no, that's not you, this is the depression, this is you, it's like this seismic change in your life. And so for me, that really was the motivation for making this work. And so I do talk about that quite a bit. And I talk about the stigma of mental illness today. And I talk about just that entire process of unearthing myself from that situation. So this is a general statement. This is an umbrella statement that talks about the entire project of falling. Now, 
This statement is specific to the series of figure drawings. And so this is a smaller subset of the following project. And I called it Emerge because this series of drawings was really about my day-to-day -day life with depression. So falling, the first half of it really was about the depression. It was about being in those emotions, what that felt like. And I actually used a model as a surrogate for myself. I didn't, these are not self-portraits. Obviously you can tell that it's not my appearance. I mean, I do consider them to be self-portraits in that they are about me and my experience, but I really felt as an artist that I had to step outside of myself to look at it a little bit more objectively. So Emerge was really about really living with depression day to day, because the thing about depression is it never like 100% disappears. You live with it, you deal with it, and it fluctuates. It's not perfect. I mean, I feel pretty good about where I am now. I feel that I have a support system. I feel that I know much better how to navigate and control it, but that doesn't mean that it's perfect every day. And so I have days where I feel that it, it's not there. And I, I feel like I get amnesia. I'm like, I, I don't have it, I'm fine. It's, it's very strange, it's really hard to explain, but I definitely have felt that way. I have other days where it, it's like, you, you just feel a little itch. It's nothing unbearable, but it's something that's there and it bothers you and it's still there. And then I have a couple of days where you're just back in the pit and it's you, as low as you can get. And so the idea, you can see, do you guys see like the female figure in the middle who's very um, upright? Oh, hi, Bon Blue. Oh yeah, thanks, I'm glad to hear that. You're happy to see me back on the stream. And so this tall female figure that you're seeing, she was intended to be my stable self when things are really going well for me and I feel that I know what I'm doing. But you can see there, there are these like demons that are circulating around her, but she is definitely more prominent. And the demons are really very thin. They're very transparent and they are not consuming her. Whereas I have other pieces where you can barely see the female figure and she's totally gone. So that was the idea is the depression emerging forward, sometimes pushing back and, and really showing that process. And so that's what I talked about in the artist statement. And I do think you guys, if you're having trouble writing an artist statement, it is really helpful to talk it through with somebody because I mean, I lecture a lot about my work and obviously I teach in the classroom. So I have a lot of experience trying to verbally articulate what I'm doing. And I think if you're somebody who doesn't teach or lecture, it can be really hard. It's really, really challenging. So if you just get a friend of yours, sometimes it's helpful if it's somebody who's an artist or even like a teacher. Like if you have an art teacher in your high school who you can speak to or an artist friend, talk it through, take notes, and I do really recommend, if you can do it, definitely try to get somebody who's good at writing to edit your statement. Because I think what happens is with artist statements, the biggest problem that I see is that people try way too hard to sound smart, okay? And the thing is like, I think when you start putting in these really vague words to like puff up what you're trying to say, I don't know about you guys, but I find it really annoying and pretentious. And so I don't know about you guys, but I try to keep the language in my artist statements pretty straightforward. I don't use words like materiality and performance. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry to rag on those words. I, I just have this like hang up about specific words because they're always used in art school. Like another villain word would be people always use juxtaposition in a critique. And I, I don't know, that's just a word that a lot of art school students sort of roll their eyes at whenever somebody uses it in a critique. But I just feel like I read a lot of artist statements where people just try to put in like really big, complicated vocabulary. And then I read these sentences. I'm like, I don't know what you said. Like, I cannot figure out what this is supposed to be. So I, I think that, um, don't try to use words you don't understand. Don't try to puff it up. Just tell you, tell us who you are. Just be straightforward. And really, the way I start writing an or statement is I just do word vomit. Like, I just write down whatever and I don't judge. I don't write a sentence and go, hmm, is that good? I don't. I just bleh, write on the page 
then I step back and I revise it like a million times. That's really the way to get a good artist statement. And I don't think it's a good idea if you guys are writing an art statement to sit down and be like, oh, I'm gonna work on my art statement for six hours. That would never work for me. I usually work in little chunks. So for example, there might be one day where I just do word vomit for like an hour. And then I step away, I come back to it the next day. I do another revision, step away, come back. That's how I happen to work. I don't know, maybe some of you guys are better doing the six hour marathon, but I really like having that distance on my writing. I find that really useful. So if that helps you guys, I think sometimes it just gives you a little bit um, more distance from the work so you can tell it a little bit better. So, I mean, I have an editor who does the writing for me because I have written a lot of things where I just really needed an editor. Otherwise it's a little bit embarrassing and it is worth getting somebody who really is an editor to do it. I mean, some of you guys may not have that as a option, but I have this friend who is an editor. She's like an editor for a magazine. She was for many years. And when she edits my stuff, I'm like, oh my God, it sounds so good. It's like, there's a reason why she's a pro as opposed to like showing it to like my sibling or so. actually my sister's very good at writing. So that's sort of not the best example. But the point is hiring a pro really is worth it. You, you can tell the difference. It's like, if I could hire a professional photographer to photograph all my work, I totally would. Because the one time I did work with a professional photographer, we did this workshop at a school I was teaching at for how to photograph artwork. I was like, oh my God, you're making artwork that isn't that great, look gorgeous. Like I just was like, how are you doing this? This is amazing. So it is worth getting that if you can, but definitely get another set of eyes on that artist statement because I think that can be extremely useful. And like I said, you guys do those keywords and really think it through. And an artist statement is not something that you write once. I feel like I am always tweaking it for the context of where I'm putting it in. I mean, for projects that I'm done with, like falling, I'm done with, I'm not working on that anymore. I might just shelve that for a little while. Sometimes I bring it out like today, I'm actually talking about it. But the general statement, I am always like, eh, maybe it's a little bit more like this. And so that's the mistake I think is that a lot of artists think that these supplementary parts like an artist statement, having a CV, social media, Instagram, and a website, people think, oh, I can just throw it up and then just sit back, kick up my heels and be done. I mean, that would be like if you opened a retail store and then just said, okay, I set up shop, done. They'll come to me. It doesn't work that way. It's something you got to work on for a while. I mean, I was telling a lot of my seniors because we are working on making sure they have a website by the end of the semester, I say to them, look, you guys, it's good to have one in the fall of your senior year because this is not something you can throw together quickly and you need to keep updating it. And the, the first part of it is the most difficult. Once you get past that initial part, it gets a lot easier. And so I say to them, if you have it now, getting your stuff together later isn't so overwhelming because a lot of people don't have one when they graduate and then it's like, oh my God, panic time. So it's very, very difficult. Okay, so I think hopefully I've given all of you guys some insight into what an artist statement is, what are some of maybe the requirements that you want to add, and also maybe a few tricks for how you can get yourself to do it, especially if you're somebody you don't feel like you're a very good writer. I think that um, definitely having a couple of those tips is very helpful. I would just say, you guys, there's no like correct way to write an artist statement. Like you, you can't say like, oh, you did it wrong. I think the, the thing that's difficult is when you write an artist statement, people still have no idea what you're doing. So I think just the clarity is very, very important. And it's, it's something you get better at because if you had asked me to write an artist statement when I was a senior in art school, ugh, it would not have been pretty. So it definitely is something you get better at. And so the more you guys work on it and keep tweaking and making those adjustments, you will get better at it. It's like lecturing about your artwork. Like a lot of students say to me, like, how can you can just go up there and do it? I'm like, I've done it so many times. 
And I just get to the point where I just don't even get nervous anymore because it's very easy for me. But it's only because I've lectured a million times and that experience goes a really long way. And so it's the same deal with a website, with an artist statement. I mean, I look at artprof.org, which by the way is up here if you guys wanna check out our main site. And I am always like seeing problems with it. Like I'm like, I thought I fixed this. <laughs> I need to add this, I need to add that. So it never really ends, but I enjoy the challenge. I think it's really interesting. I mean, I could keep working on it forever, which is why of course we're still here. So anyway, thank you guys so much for tuning into this stream. And I hope some of you will consider supporting us on Patreon. And of course I, oh, there it is. Um, because we run on a shoestring budget. We are entirely based on donations. And if you guys want us to continue making this content, and I hope you do, I hope you'll support us. Give us a one-time donation through PayPal. You can donate monthly because my whole thing right now, I just want Art Prof to stay alive. I know that that sounds like, God, Claire, you got really low standards, but that's how precarious running Art Prof is because we, we run on so little money and there's so many expenses, like all our production equipment, hiring our staff, maintaining the site. It just really never ends. And honestly, if we have a bigger budget, we can do more for you. We can produce more content. It's a win-win situation. And we are so happy even the smallest donation is helpful. So I hope you guys will consider that. And thank you for tuning in and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.